So we're here today to talk about well-managed objects. Now, if, you've just, if you were just in Anthony's talk, you know that core data is pretty complex, right? Um, you've got all these different moving parts, and uh, the things that I'm going to talk about are what are useful in a, in a complex core data app. So you, you, know, you might you want to have things. So like Anthony was saying, you know, it can get complex when you're doing something like you're syncing data down from, from some, some web source while you're wanting to edit it. Um, and yeah, traditionally that's been, it's all, it's all possible in core data, but really hard. Um, and it's still kind of tricky, but, but some of the new stuff in line and <coughs> IO type um, make, make it heaps easier. So, hey. So, um, okay, I mean, you were all in, most of you were in Anthony's talk, but let's have a quick recap on the parts that, that, that I'm going to refer to. So we've got some, so first of all, there's the, there's the actual objects that we're using, right? So which are subclasses of, of NS managed objects. So that's, you know, the employee, the department, what have you. Um, and we've, we've got heaps of these, right? You know, you've got one for every employee. The, the next most common thing you deal with is the NS managed object context. So that's sort of like your mediator that you, is what you interact with to, get your objects, fetch them, save them. Um, and you, you have more than one of these. There's, there's only the simplest core data app will only have one managed object context. But having said that, even a complex one, you don't have many. You know, you, you have some. Uh, next down the line is the persistent store coordinator. Now, I've got here one. You can actually have more than these, but it's, it's pretty rare. Um, we'll talk about why you might in a minute. And then we've got the actual persistent object store. So that's, you know, we've got the actual file, right? So in iOS, that's always SQLite. Um, on the Mac, it can be SQLite or XML or, or in memory. And also in, in line, and I think iOS 5 as well, you can actually write your own persistent store implementations. So for instance, there's a, there's a well, you have been up to on the Mac for a while, and there's a sample project in, that you can get in, in the Xcode docs, which uses HTML tables as a persistent object store for core data. Obviously not a good idea, but it sh shows that you can do that. So again, normally you, you only have one of these. Um, and then uh, the, the other thing that we, we talk about is the manage object model. So the persistent object store you'll see here has got kind of two parts. We've got the actual file, which let's, let's just say it's SQLite, uh, um, or, 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 yeah, or XML, right? And then in terms of mapping that into um, the manage objects, the persistent object store needs some, um, needs some extra information, which is our manage object model, which is basically some kind of binary representation of the funky, you know, gooey stuff that Anthony showed you, you know, what the class definitions and what type it is and constraints and what have you. So, so this is where that all, that all sort of happens. Uh, I get the other, while we're here, the other thing to, to note is that um, you've got different types of caching here and, and here. So the NS manage object context in a sense caches because if you ask it for an, if you try to do a, a fetch for an employee um, that the manage object context already has, it's just going to give you that object. Um, if you try to fetch out of the manage object context an employee that it doesn't have, it'll ask the persistent store coordinator for it. Uh, and the persistent store coordinator, let, let's, let's assume it's talking to SQLite that's got what is effectively a row level cache, like, like in MySQL or Postgres or what have you. So again, even if you don't have the managed object context, the persistence object store might still have remembered that, that row from either having written it or read it recently. And so again, it still isn't hitting the disk, it's, it's then just building an object. Uh, right, so that's, that's just some things to keep in mind. So why would you want more than one context? First thing to note is it's not needed for, and that should say fetching performance. It's not needed for fetching performance. Um, the, the core data underlying code, if, if you're doing some, some mega fetch and you know, that, that's got some complex, maybe it's got some complex aggregates or something, um, and, and you're on a, on a machine with multiple cores, 
then core data can, if it decides it needs to, split that work across multiple cores. So it's already doing that for you. You don't, oh, I said that there. So it can parallelize fetching. So you might want it because you're doing, you might want more than one context because you're doing background fetching and processing. So the example that Anthony said, uh, you know, is tricky. Like say, let's, let's say, I mean, not, you wouldn't use it for Twitter, Twitter app, but let's say you've got an app that is downloading data from a, from a web store and you can edit it as well, uh, and the download takes a while, well, you don't want to say to the user, okay, you can't edit anything while I'm downloading this stuff. So you, you, would, you would use a separate context for your background fetching um, because it also might fail partway and whatnot. We'll cover that later. Um, and uh, you can, for isolation of change, yeah. So thinking about that background fetching, let's say you're downloading something and it, it's important that you, you know, it comes in as a transaction. You know, you want to either import all of your employees or, or none of them. Um, so using, like I said, the, the managed object context kind of has its own in-memory cache of all these objects. It's not until you save it that it goes anywhere else. So if you get part way through a process or something and, and you hit an error, well, you can just, you, can just, you know, release that, that managed object context and you haven't done anything because all you've done is affect that memory. Um, Having said that, uh, something that some people do is use a separate context to back out changes when really they should be using an undo manager. So core data makes it really easy for, in, in sort of standard circumstances, for you to do, it basically provides you an undo manager. So if you, for instance, have an existing object um, and you wanted to, you know, on an iPhone, you want to go to the edit screen, edit it, and then you think, okay, I'm hitting the cancel button instead of the save. You don't want to say, okay, the cancel is just throwing away the context. Because, well, it, you'd have to think carefully about it. In, in most cases, in something like that, if it's the UI, what you really wanted to do is you wanted to trigger an undo because maybe something else has happened. But anyway, so that's something to keep in mind as well. There's other reasons as well, but that, they're kind of the, the, some of the obvious reasons. So I said you norm, normally only want one persistent store coordinator, but let's think quickly about why you want more than one and then we'll completely forget about it. The, probably the most common one is you might have two totally different stores. So think about a Mac application that could be, a, or, or even a, now on, on again, iOS 5 with UI document applications. So you've got a, an application where you've got a separate core data store per document, you know, that's your keynote file or whatever. Uh, and you might have a, your application might have its own core data store for storing, I don't know, not preferences, because that would be a stupid way to do it, but let's pretend that it is. So you've got a then persistent store coordinator for the two different files because they're totally separate databases. Uh, but you can also have more than one persistent store coordinator for a single store. So like I said, you don't need to do anything like this to increase your read speed, but you might want more parallelism for, um, uh, for you know, writes or for... Um, actually, I'm not, I'm not sure whether the implicit parallelization is at this level or the higher level. Anyway, there, there, there are times when, and I've, I've never done it, but apparently, there's times when you want to do a persistent store coordinate because, you know, it's doing disk access and it's going to block, and uh, especially if you're using SQLite, SQLite supports multiple clients reading and writing mul different parts of the file at the same time, so you can get, get more parallelism that way. Uh, and again, having said that, with the new techniques that, are, that we're going to talk about today, you don't need, disk access is, is often not as important. You really need to do disk access when you actually need to fetch the data originally or when you want to save it. I might just shut this door. So hopefully we, um, yeah, in practice you really do and we probably need to do it even less. All right. So, and we will get to code eventually, I promise. So the, the old way of doing multiple contexts, you can still do it this way. Um, you, so, so let's say we've got this app where we're doing some sort of background internet fetching, plus we're still letting people edit it in the front end. So let's say that's, let's say this is the front end one. Oh, hang on, I've got a laser pointer. Let's say this is the front end one, and this is the, you know, the back end fetching. Uh, again, like I said, you could have separate persistent store coordinates for each of these, but that actually is a lot more work. So let's assume we have one, that's the common case, obviously the one file. So, you have a problem, right? Because this, this managed object context is downloading stuff from the internet and then it says, all right, I'm finished now, happy days, I'm going to save them and so they get saved to this database 
So, but maybe it wasn't just a new employee. Maybe, um, uh, you know, a, an employee has, um, has changed some information. This, um, or, or maybe in, while it's, as it's downloading it, this one over here has changed something. So, in, in the old way, the, the way that this was always ha handled is every time a managed object context did a, a save, it sends a, it sends a notification to, you know, in, inside your app, it publishes a, an NS notification. And that notification you can listen to in your own code, and you have to if you're doing this sort of setup. And, and when, when that notification comes through that says, hey, I've made some changes and they've been, they've been saved to the disk, what you do for every other managed object context in your app is you listen to that notification, you take the data in that notification and merge that into your other managed object context. So that now, this one here matches what's on the disk, so you don't have any stale changes. Um, once you've got that set up, um, it's you know it's kind of not too bad, but it's a pain to set up, and, and there's there's it's fairly inflexible, and there's there's sort of some caveats that, that can shoot you in the foot. Now, these managed object contexts they they may well be on different threads, or they might be on the same thread. It doesn't really matter. But um, a, a common model that people have been programming to that, that I think is sort of over, overly painful is, is tracking a managed object context per thread. So let's say you want to fire up a new thread. Well, you make a managed object context for that. Um, if you ever want to reference an object in a different, that was fetched from a different thread, all you can do is pass this, this sort of object ID. It's kind of like a you know, reference ID of the object ask your managed object coordinator for your thread to fetch that ID, it'll do another fetch. And, um, you know, it, it gets a bit painful, but more than painful, it gets risky because you have to, your, your code, you have to have a, a practice in place to make sure that you know you're only ever accessing that managed object context from the appropriate thread. So that's the old way. All right, the new way. So in Lion and iOS 5, you, there, there's, a, there's a, a couple of new things which, which, all, which, which sort of work hand in hand. Firstly, a great new way of doing multiple contexts is every managed object context now, so the, and this assumes you're using the new way. You've kind of got a choice. You can either use what they call the thread confinement model, which is the old way, and you have to do it using all the old techniques, uh, or you can do the new way, and it's sort of, it's sort of all or nothing. Now, assuming you are doing it the new way, Every managed object context has a parent of some sort. Either it's got a persistent store coordinator, like we saw already, or it can have another NS managed object context as its parent. So how that works is, okay, so if we pretend we don't have this for the minute, then it's, it's exactly the same as before, right? This managed object context does a fetch. If it's not in the cache, it comes out of the file, it does a save, it goes back down to the file. This uh, fetches and saves are slightly different if we have um, a parent. Now, we could have multiple managed object context parenting off this one, um, or again, we could have another managed object context parenting off this one. Whenever we do a fetch, uh, Core Data promises that when you do a fetch, it's always going to be the latest data from the database. Now, it doesn't always have to hit the file because it's, it's sort of tracking what's happening. But if, if, you know, if the object doesn't exist here, it'll pull it out. If it does exist here and it's up to date, it'll pull that out. If it exists here but it's not up to date because someone else has, has updated it, then it, it core data promises that you'll always be pulling the, the latest version. How saves work is when we, when we do a save on this managed object context, all it does is it, so let's say we've added this new department here, sales. When we do the save, it's going to push that new department down to here, and that's all. We then have to tell this managed object context, okay, please save, and then it goes down to the disk. So, that's one of the reasons why we, we're not as reliant on disk access as we used to be. Because if we have these two managed object contexts, to sync them up, I don't have to save to disk here and then ask this one to merge in those changes. I just say save, and all in memory, it just pushes it down. And we can have some complex graph, it all pushes down, and, and we haven't hit the disk at all. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say here. So that's the new... Uh, concept of parents in managed object context. The other new concepts which go hand in hand is, is the, the, two the two different concurrency models. So there's thread confinement, which is the old way. Um, yeah, so like I said, people used to have, you know, people have got 
either methods or special classes for keeping one managed object context per thread, and uh, it's, it gets pretty tricky. So instead, we can, we can say, okay, we're not, we're not going to do that at all. We're going to use this new way, which means that when we create a managed object context, well, we have to pass in one of these three options. Um, and really, there's two approaches. There's either thread confinement or there's this queue confinement. So we'll see in a minute. We'll make a, a new um, project in Xcode saying, you know, the new, um, with, with, with the, the main, um, the, the new template. Um, actually, then we'll change the template. But the, the, the managed object context that you would have seen Anthony using his code is, is that's the one that you're using on the main thread because you're using it to interact with your, your user interface. And that's called the, the main queue confinement. So um, these are pretty much the same, except main queue confinement has, is sort of a little bit different because it's spe specifically running on the main thread. You can then, and there's always only one of these. You can then have, you can create as many as you want of these private queues, private queue confinement manage object contexts, and these run on, so it's all based on, who, who here has done anything with Grand Central Dispatch or um, NS operation queues? Okay, so I probably should have a slide on that. So Grand Central Dispatch is part of, it's been in, in um, iOS since, iOS 4, Mac since for a while, and it's basically a way of doing concurrency without having to deal with threads directly. So, so you can take a, a block of operation, which can be a, a block, um, or, or it can be an NS operation object, and you basically put it in a queue. And a queue can be, can be serial, which means that it'll just run one after the other, or it can be parallel, in which case the OS will say, okay, I'll run it, I'll create as many threads as makes sense for the number of CPUs and the load on this machine and sort of spread it across. Uh, and you don't have to do any of that. You just, you just say, okay, here's a unit of work. Please do it on whatever thread makes sense. So with the private queue confinement, um, whenever we ask that managed object context to do something, it's doing that complex work of tracking what thread it it's kind of belongs to or which queue it belongs to. Uh, and you just give it the unit of work, and it'll do it on the, on the correct thread. So, so gone is that risk of accidentally trying to use a managed object context on a different thread and getting, getting odd results. Um, and it also means that, and these two things combined with that parenting means that we don't even have to have, so, so remember there was always the, let's go back. Remember we've always got this one managed object context that's dealing with the disk. This one doesn't have to be the one on the main thread anymore. This could be one of your other thread, one of your other, you know, on a private queue. This one could be the managed object context that we have on the main thread so that when we do save, we don't even have to potentially block the, the UI anymore because that can be happening on another queue. Now, I'm not doing that in the example because there's, there's a bit more work to do with that. Um, yeah, like, okay. So, uh, so queue confinement. Basically, this is the same for the main queue, thread queue confinement or the cut or the private queue. It's just where it runs. There's there's one there's basically one rule um, which you can which you can ignore a little bit on the main queue confinement objects. This is going to get a bit wordy, uh, but the private queue ones you always have to do it this way. You can't ever just say in a random chunk of code, you know, manage object context perform fetch or, or what have you. We always have to do it through one of these two options. We say perform block, and then we have a, a block of work here, or we say perform block and wait, and we have a block of work here. And the difference is pretty obvious, right? Perform block will return immediately, and that'll go in the queue and will happen at some stage in the future. And perform block and wait, um, it doesn't go into uh, a queue, it'll just, it'll just execute on the appropriate thread and then return straight away, when it's, or wait until it's finished and then return. Um, so yeah, because it operates on, the, it executes on the relevant queue. The, let, let's say this could be a, a, let's say this one here. This could be a background, um, some sort of private queue managed object context that's supposed to run on a background thread. We can call this line on the main thread. It's going to return straight away because it's just putting something on a queue, so it's not blocking the main thread. And this stuff will execute on whatever thread that managed manage object context is, is supposed to operate on. So it takes all of that thinking out of it. Um, and the final part, now I missed the start of your talk, Anthony. Did you talk about the undo manager? Okay. So one of the neat things about core data, and this sort of ties in with how it gives you iCloud stuff auto magically, is core data gives you an undo manager, which you can then wire into your UI. 
So what that means is instead of having to track, okay, this is what happened to make this change and so therefore this is what I have to do when the user hits command Z, um, we just tell Core Data, oh, please undo whatever was just done and Core Data will re have, it's remembered, oh, that was updating this property and so I'll just roll that update back. The, now Core Data has this concept of user events because if you've updated three properties, quite often what you, or let's say you've inserted five words, quite often command Z, you want to mean, okay, here's things that as far as the program are concerned are discrete events, but as far as the user, they're one thing. So when I hit undo, I want to undo that whole thing. Um, now with the old way of Cordata, you had to kind of say, you know, begin, event, end, event, what have you. With the queue confinement, everything within one of these blocks is considered as a user event. So again, without even doing any real extra work, we've already grouped it how it makes sense to us programmatically. And that's also giving a, giving a hint or telling core data that when you're doing all that undo stuff, you know, here's undo it in, in this whole block. So that's another, another nice thing for free that you get from core data. All right. Now, before we hit some code, does anyone have any, any questions on that? Anything that kind of isn't gelling? No? Okay, good. Um, how are we going for time? Perfect, halfway. All right. Now, so, Xcode. All right, so um, when, when, you, when you're making a new project, um, now I'm gonna give all the examples in line for two reasons. One is we're legally allowed to talk about it, um, even though the same options are available in iOS 5, but also it made doing my sample app a heck of a lot easier because I could use bindings. So um, I'm gonna go with that. Um, and fear not, I'm not going to live code. It's all, it's all pre-baked. But if we were making a new project, we, we you know, say file new projects. So in this case, we'll do a Cocoa application. We say, you know, use core data. Um, you can also make a document-based application with core data. Same in iOS now with iOS 5's um, UI document. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, I've got a semicolon. I wonder if that'll work. Screen recording really slows down your computer. Okay, desktop, creates. Um, now we're not going to use this, but I just wanted to show you what happens when you create any kind of core data project. You get this, uh, <laughs> that's a fun name, it's AppDelegate. Um, basically, you get the core data model, which, which Anthony showed you. You've got the main menu nib. Um, now in the AppDelegate, there's, there's a, a bunch of things that we, that, that we sort of refer to as the core data stack. So it's the... Um, you know, the manage object model, the persistent store coordinator, the manage object context, those things I showed you, they all have to get created. Um, and Apple gives you code to do that. So, where are we? Okay, so manage object model is pretty, pretty simple. Basically, there's a, some binary file that's been generated by that GUI, and, you know, it just, it just gets loaded. Um, now we have a persistent store coordinator that uses the manage object model, so which it gets from it, you know, itself. Um, it has to figure out, you know, what the path to the to the actual SQLite or XML file is. Um, blah 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 blah. We've got the things about whether we're going to do a migration or not that Anthony showed you, and obviously, you know, your error here. So we found the path, and now basically here we're loading it, right? So we just uh, sorry here. We're, so uh, so we're um, creating a persistent store coordinator. We're um, then, you know, setting all the properties and saying here's a file and whatnot. Okay, that's fine. And then the managed object context. So this is using the old thread confinement model, um, which you can tell, because basically if you use the old APIs, then there is no way to say what sort of confinement you want. So by default, you get thread confinement. Um, and so this is, this is assuming that whenever you call this method managed object context, you, you, you want this same managed object context, the one that was created on the main thread. Um, so that's, you know, the one used for your UI. Your, your UI. Oh, and then we can see here, um, now again, especially if you're doing an, um, a document-based um, app for, for Mac or iOS, literally undo stuff is completely free. You know, it's already wired up here. Um, if you change something in the document, the core data objects, and someone says undo, it just undo undoes it, yeah, which is pretty awesome. So there's a couple of problems here. One is just using the old thread confinement that we don't want. Um, the other thing is that... <laughs> As, 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 you've, as you learn, as you do more, um, 
you know, more Mac programming. The templates that come with Xcode are really crap. So, so this one here, for instance, is not thread safe, right? Um, if you, now, it's kind of okay because, because here they're only, um, they're only providing the, the managed object context for the main thread, so they're assuming, okay, it's only going to get called from the main thread, but we're going to make other ones. So let's just close that down and let's look at our project. So the app delegate's almost exactly the same, apart from stuff I've added. Um, so the differences are, all right, so here you see I've, I've gotten rid of that, that manage object context method, and I've got a method here called main queue manage object context. So partly I've just changed the name so that it's obvious this is the one you should only be using on the main thread. Um, uh, but also it's been created with a helper method here, but I'm also using grand central dispatch here to, to in a thread safe way, create this object. So if it happens that during our app startup, some other thread is asking for a manage object context before the main thread happens to, we're not going to have any, any um, threading issues. Um, so, current manage object context. Okay, so, so basically the two methods we're going to use in our code, and we'll see, is we call this method when we want to get the context that we're going to use on the main thread. Uh, and we call this method when we want to make a new manage object context because we're going to do some background fetching or something like that. Um, and basically what that's doing is that's creating a manage object context that, whose parent is the one on the main, the main thread. So if you remember the, the diagram, we're creating kind of the top one, you know, or potentially multiples of the, the top one that feed into that main one. Uh, again, like I said, if, if, you want to be, if you want to be smart, what you actually want to do is you want to have a private queue manage object context that is sort of your, you know, uber parent right down the bottom of the tree so you can do stuff like saving in the background. And the, the UI document um, standard application, you know, template in iOS 5 actually does that. Um, I haven't done that in this, in this example because it, it, there's, there's a number of things that you have to start being very careful about when you do that. So, for instance, when you quit an application, either on the Mac or the iOS, you know, you, you, your method gets called, you know, should application quit, you can say terminate now or what have you. And if you're, um, if you're always saving on the main thread when someone clicks save or whatever, then you're totally safe because you can't ever receive that message until, you know, halfway through a save because the main thread's blocked. If you're saving on the background thread, you now have to be doing stuff like tracking and saying, okay, if I'm halfway through a core data save, I need to make sure the main thread doesn't let the application quit until I've finished, things like that. So with power comes, comes great responsibility, so I haven't done that. Um, okay, so here's the, the method that's actually doing the creation of all of those context from those helper methods above. So you'll see, okay, so here we can just see when we create the managed object context, we just say in, in it with concurrency type, um, and the concurrency type can either be NS private queue concurrency type or NS main queue concurrency type. It's pretty easy. Or there's also the NS thread queue concurrency type if you want the old type. Um, and my helper method here, you can also pass in the parent. If there's a parent, it sets that as a parent. If there's no parent set in, then it must be wanting to save straight to the disk. So it's, so you can, you can basically either have a parent context or a persistence store coordinate. You can't have both and you can't have neither. Um, that's, that sort of makes sense. Managed object model is exactly the one from the Apple template, except again, I've made it thread safe. Same with a persistent store coordinator. It's the same. I just made it thread safe. Uh, and that's it. Oh, and you'll see, I've completely commented out this application should terminate stuff because uh, instead of saving it when we could, I, I want to demo some other things. So that's why that's commented out. Um, now, as Anthony also said, this is why I'm really glad your talk went first. There's, there's a lot of pain associated with core data often. You know, there's, there's sort of, there's, there's a lot of boilerplate. So, oh, no wonder I'm slowing down spotlights indexing. Uh, that you sort of, there can be a bit of boilerplate code. Um, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some pain to do with when you're doing updates that Mode Generator can help you with. Uh, there's, there's a class that um, has been quite popular that, that you might have seen called uh, Magical Record, which, which is basically a, a sort of a, a, some classes you can drop in to give you a whole stack of helpers. That's actually quite neat, except that, well, for, for one, it doesn't do anything with this, these new confinement types. Um, but, uh, you know, we all like to do it, roll our own stuff. So I always have my own convenience helpers. Um, and I'll give you a quick show, showing of what I do here. Actually, we'll just look at the headers. So 
you end up writing, you know, obviously a bunch of fixed requests and things like that. So um, now, uh, oh yeah, and the other thing, Magical Record has, um, it sort of follows that model I, I described where it tracks uh, managed object context per thread. Now the great thing is that if you want to do that approach, Magical Record does it all for you. So you just basically say, hey, please get me, um, you know, please get me these objects from core data and it knows what threads you're on, it knows if it has to make a managed object context or not, it kind of hides all that for you. Instead of doing that, the way I do it is basically, so I've got these helper methods that let me do easy stuff like, you know, fetch, like find all objects, um, find objects matching a particular predicate or potentially with a sort descriptor. Um, and I always pass through a managed object context because potentially you might have a class which you want to use on the main thread and you might want to use that on a background thread as well. So instead of the class understanding what context it should be using, you, can, you just pass it in, which I think is the best way. Um, you've got a helper there for entity name, which well, my generator can do that for you, um, and some other boring stuff. Oh, and, and uh, save, with it, uh, save with error handler. So one of the, um, when you save core data, you, you've got a, you have to keep in mind that you are saving, first of all, you're saving an object graph. So and, and in, in, the, in the GUI where you're setting up properties, you might have constraints. So, you know, if you say something can't be null, it can't be blank, and someone tries to save it blank, you're going to get an error. And then you also need to remember, you're actually, as well as just saving to disk, which can have errors, you're probably saving to an SQLite database store. So you might hit some sort of database error if you've done something wrong and you've got some corruption or something. So you actually need to, really need to handle errors every time you do a save and do something useful with them. Um, now, in this example, we're not, but... Again, I've got some, some helpers here that I like where uh, I pass in a block for every time I save. So instead of having to do, you know, save, if not save, then do this, uh, I can just pass in a block and then that'll take care of that for me. Right, so now let's get to the meat of it. Let's, let's, I'll run the app and then um, and I'll talk through what we're doing with these new confinement types and, um, and the, the parents and how that helps us and then how we do it. Now, I have internet connectivity. Let's see if this works. So we've got a recipe. In the WWDC tradition, I'm using a, a recipe app. Um, this one's pretty basic. Let's add a recipe. Uh, it's got a title and an URL for the recipe. So we've got an Apple turnover. All right, that's all we know about it for now, so save. Okay, so we've got, we've got in our list of recipes here, we've got this new recipe I just added, Apple turnover. It's in our main thread manage object context. It's not saved to disk. Now I've got two buttons here. Um, view this object, so let's do that. Monitor is quite small. Okay, and, and now this second window here is exactly the same except I've created a new manage object context. So I've got one of those private queue manage object context um, that, you know, it's got its own queue, it's a parent. Its parent is the main thread manage object context. Yeah? So, this, this one here is the one that's, that's also tied to the, the, just the regular main thread manage object context. So you can see what happens when I edit this. The, when I edit this, the, um, the, the, main, the main list will also update because they're both using the same context. All right. So you can see here we've already got this is updated to apple.com because, because they're using the same manage object context, even though they, these two windows individually ask the manage object context for this record, as I said, the manage object context holds those, you know, that object graph in its cache. It's just returned exactly the same object. So I've literally just changed the property on here. And because I'm using automatic updating bindings, this one here, it is the same object that's connected to this field. So, but we'll see this one hasn't changed, right? Because this one, is, has the, the new private queue managed object context. And so it's the one at the top. And even though, well, so for starters, we haven't saved. But even if we had saved, that top one wouldn't know anything about it because, um, you know, it, it doesn't automatically fetch from its parents. From its parents. So we can do a refetch, which will pull that in. Um, and there's a special code to do that if you want to pull in new updates. I'll show you that. Um, or if in fact we hadn't opened this window or, in, or I opened a brand new window, obviously, remember I said that when you do a fetch, it always pulls the latest version. So had I made a new window, then with, you know, that's always going to fetch it. All right, so we've got that. So now let's look at the reverse. Um, let's, um, 
let's modify this one. So this one is the, the, the one with the parent. So I'll drag this image in here. Okay, so we've, um, of course, an image of pancakes, not apple turnover. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we've updated this. This object is now changed, but obviously it hasn't changed over here because it's in its separate managed object context. We hit save. And remember again, what I said is that that saved it now down to its parent managed object context, but still not on the disk. Um, I, I w oh yeah, well, if, if, so if we, um, if we quit now, because I, I'm not saving on quit, we'll run it. Oh, actually, well, I didn't, no, I messed that up. I didn't save it at all, so there's going to be no recipes at all. Anyway, okay, let's ignore that. Um, okay, so that's sort of a good, a good demonstration of, um, you know, interacting with those different managed object contexts. But so a more useful, obviously you're not normally going to give your users buttons to you know, view an object in different managed object contexts. But let's, um, so let's do something more useful. So I'm, we're going to download some recipes from Punchfork, which is an online recipe thing that has an API. So we're going to, um, we want to import from Punchfork all the recipes that have cocoa in, in the, as an ingredient. So um, now you have to watch kind of quickly because the internet's reasonably fast here. But so I've got two progress bars here. We've got uh, downloading recipes is when it's actually pulling down the JSON. It's going to have to go and hit that a few times because it's about 100 recipes. It gets 10 at a time. Um, and then the inserting recipes we get to see a bit slower because as I'm inserting the recipe, I also pull down the thumbnail image to insert in the database. Um, now actually before we run that, let's look at the code because that'll uh, probably be more interesting. So, okay, so we've got the recipe object, which, you know, comes from core data. We've got the main window controller, which is not that interesting. Um, okay, so I've got this punch fork class, which is literally just doing, you know, internet download stuff. Um, where are we? Okay, so it's pulling the, you know, the API key from a plist. Uh, okay, so we've got... These two methods, we're just we're basically we're either doing the initial request or um, from punch fork in the punch fork API. When we do an initial request, if there's more data to come, you know, we get a cursor to say we can make a further request. So we're really just doing a URL, um, uh, which you can see in the template at the top, um, where we're, we're we're saying you know here's the query string, here's our API key, um, here's the cursor if it's a continuing one. NSL request, we're getting the data. Nothing too exciting there. Um, now, I'm just doing stuff the super easy way. If you, if you use something like, um, and I'm using the line and iOS 5 built-in JSON decoding, if you use something fancier like YIJL you can, and you've got a big JSON download, you can, you can start interpreting chunks of the JSON even before the download's finished, which is great on iOS especially because you've got slow downloads and, and you know, slow, slow disk and what have you. So, um, but I'm not doing that. So I'm just stuffing it all in this data. When that particular connection is finished, uh, right, we're calling the delegate, which we'll look at in a minute, that's the window controller, to basically say, here's a bunch of recipes that we've received, which is just an NS dictionary. Um, and potentially continue, or potentially tell the delegate that we've finished. That's, that's really all we're doing with that. So the window controller is where we're doing the core data stuff. Oh, sorry, before we do that. Um, there is one thing we need to look at in the main window, which I've just shoved in the app delegate because I was lazy, is when we click the download button. So we're creating the window controller and connecting that to the nib, nothing exciting there. But I'm giving, telling the window to controller to use this, to use this manage object context. So if you remember from the helper methods, this is creating one of those new private queue manage object context that whose parent is the main key, manage object context. So the window control is operating on, on a different one to the one that the, the, the main window is. All right, so when we actually do, uh, say, go, we're just calling that start download with a string out of the text box. So you remember that, that we looked at. Okay, so the interesting stuff here. Recipes received. So this is when, this is as we're downloading the JSON data. So we're just getting metadata about the recipes. And remember, we're going to get, this is going to get called multiple times because we're getting the download is coming in 10 recipes at a time and there's 100 and something. So um, we've got the manage object context. 
we're calling here, like I said, manage object context perform block. So remember, this is not perform block and wait. So this is just going to return straight away. And all it's going to do is put this block of work onto the appropriate queue um, to be processed in, in sequence. So uh, we're starting the progress indicator animating. Um, we are, okay, so the recipe um, is an array of multiple recipes that are dictionaries. And we're, you know, create a new, um, okay, so this is again a helper method um, in those helper classes I showed you, but basically what Anthony would have showed you as well, you know, you, you get an entity, you say, please give me a new object matching the entity recipe. But you, you type that so many times, if you don't have a helper method, you'll go mad. So we've got a new recipe object, so that's our co blank core data object. We set the title, we set the URL string. Um, now remember, this is on a private queue, this is a background queue, so even though it's not the best way to do it, it's, it's you know, perfectly okay to just have a blocking method to download that, that image data, shove that in the thumbnail. Um, and, uh, and that's the end of the work block. So, so this is going to get called sort of 10 or 15 times, and each of these blocks are going to get shoved in the queue. Now, because the JSON will download so much quicker than the, the um, image thumbnails, by the time the, all of the JSONs finish downloading, there's still, there's, there's still going to be um, a stack of these blocks in the queue. And they might be interleaved, right? There's probably be a couple of blocks um, from the, oh no, sorry, they're all just going in sequentially, so they're not. All right. And then when we finish, we just, okay, so then, now in this example, obviously in this case, well, potentially a smart thing to do would be to have a save at the end of this for loop, right? So that, so that as the data is coming down, we're making it available to the user straight away. But what I'm doing in this case is, it's not until the API has told us, yeah, look, you've got all hundred and whatever recipes, that that's when I'm doing the save. So that gives us the ability, like I said, that we can treat this, this whole block as a, as a transaction. So, we can, so, so we've effectively said, look, if some of the recipes haven't downloaded because there was a network error or something, then we're just going to completely drop that manage object context. None of them will ever go down to our main context or the disk. So we can then safely say, ah, oh, that failed, we've got an error. I'll do it again, and I'm not going to end up with duplicates for the first half or whatever that got downloaded. So um, now, if if we were inserting these into the um, the main context, and you know maybe maybe the case is that uh, we had a more complex graph where let's say we've got recipes, and maybe it was a separate um, a separate entity that was the ingredients for the recipes. You know, that was a list, and we were getting them in separate parts of the API. You could have a circumstance where you've created the recipe object, you get a network error, so you haven't added the re the ingredients. You've now got a recipe with no ingredients, and if you tried to save that, maybe that would cause a, an error because you've got a constraint saying all recipes should have ingredients. And that, that's, that's a classic problem of, of doing something like this with core data if you're just shoving it all into the main context because now your main context is in an inconsistent state where you can't save it. But in the meantime, the user's gone and done some other stuff that they want to save, so it's nearly impossible to be able to get your manage object context back into a state where you've gotten your changes out and then still be able to save the user changes. You try to do it, your app crashes, the user lost the data, they're really pissed off. So this makes, it, this makes it easy. And you can see, like I said, we're doing everything here in the perform block. So um, you know, it's all happening on, on the appropriate queue. Okay, that's pretty much all there is, so let's do it. So we're gonna do Coco, search and add. So we're downloading the JSON. All of it's, now we're downloading JSON and images already. So the queues, yeah. And now the JSON's all finished. And we can see here total recipes is 10, 20. It's going up 10 at a time. Let's, in the meantime, add a recipe over here. Blah. I just want to do a real URL so it doesn't mess up my web view. We'll save that. Um, so we can see this is still showing even number 10s, even though um, we've got an odd number because we've added one over here because it's, you know, it's the parent one. So even while this is happening, the user's merrily interacting with their data doing stuff. Um, and then it's not until this is finished that it'll actually push it all over, which it will fairly soon. Uh, and so for instance, I can save this. So that's now saved to disk. Um, if I quit, which I won't because I want this to finish, and start it again, we would have aborted that. We'd still have the one recipe. So here we go. That's just finished. We've got 126 recipes. Bam, they're in there. Um, and you know, all in simply by putting them in on that other managed object context, putting them in these blocks here, we completely avoided that whole potential problem of 
first of all, if we did want to do it on a background thread, all of the funky merging stuff we used to have to do, um, and we don't have any problems of you know, screwing up our main managed object context. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to show you. So any, um, uh, oh, one cool thing I will show you, it's just sort of a side effect because I wanted to do a thumbnail. So you'll know that there's no, I mean obviously you don't want to put big images in core data, but you often want to put things in core data that there's no standard model for. So if we look at the data model here, this thumbnail object is called type transformable. Oh, you did transform? Okay, all right. Well, I've got, anyway, I've got an image transformable. Okay, good. Thank you. So, okay, has anyone got any, any questions? In the few minutes we've got left. Yeah. Oh sure, this is this is not a uh, this is not a shippable app. Well, so yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're doing something like recipes, then I think you're right. You, you probably just want to be shoving it, and as soon as they become available, you're getting better gratification. Yeah, and it's and it's easy to make sure you're not doing something like a duplicate. Um, if you're doing something like a, um, you know, you're downloading a, a, I don't know, a reconciliation report from your bank. Um, well, again, actually, that's pretty easy to detect duplicates, but there's, there's, there's often cases where you, don't, you, know, you want to do stuff. So I intentionally did this this way just to show that, that approach. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you'd probably just shove it in one at a time. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and for instance, you, if you were doing this using the old thread confinement, and let's say you were doing a Twitter app, um, you don't want to do this. You wouldn't want to do the save after every tweet comes in because that's hitting the disk and it's all getting bog slow. Because this is now just—I mean, it's not free. It's fairly complex um, operations, but it's all just code in memory. So you know, you probably you probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to do it on a big Twitter feed. But certainly for recipes, there's no reason why you couldn't save after every single recipe. Whereas with the old approach, you wouldn't want to because that's hitting the disk. Right, because it tells you, yeah. Yeah. So, well, actually, for instance, Twitter's a good case of where you couldn't do it that way because you, you, you don't have sort of a unique ID per Twitter. You just know, okay, what are all the tweets and timelines since this particular timestamp or this particular tweet? If you get partway through and you're not exactly sure what happens, really the only safe thing to do is to do that whole block again. So. Yeah, iOS 5 and Lion only. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I, yeah, I use, I probably use it more in, in Cocoa headset. Oh, so now oh, I didn't have it on my slides. Um, I'm, I meant to have a, uh, a, a promotion at the end of my slide. I don't think I have it. For um, Cocoa Heads, yeah, just kidding. Um, so, if you don't know, Cocoa Heads is a, a global organisation. We have um, meetings in Australia, in Sydney, and Melbourne, and very rarely in Brisbane. Uh, it's basically um, for any Mac-related development stuff. We get together once a month in Melbourne. They get together a couple of times a month. Um, we have talks or, or just hack nights where people get together and program. And so, if um, you know, if you're into any kind of Mac programming, then or, or you know, Apple-related programming, so iOS and Mac, then, then you should be coming along. Um, just go to cocoheads.org, and you'll find out. Now, um, sorry, what was the actual question that I was answering? Did someone ask a question that prompted oh, me about that? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah oh, yeah, am I using Cordata all the time? So that reminded me, because there's been a big debate. We've had a run of talks of people saying, here's SQ Lite, here's how super fast it is, here's Cordata. So, you know, definitely Cordata isn't for everything. Um, with, with these new approaches, there's, there's, there's classes of, opera, of, of apps where before you wouldn't have used core data because it would just be too painful, but now it's less painful. Um, and there's just stuff you get for free. So like I said, if it's document-based, man, you just get undoing completely for free. If it's not document-based, undoing is pretty easy. Um, you know, as Anthony said, you get increased performance as Apple brings out new, new performance things. Um, and you know, a perfect example of, of why 
if it suits, you should stick with kind of the standard Apple way of doing stuff is they just keep rolling out more stuff for free. So iCloud, if you've got a document-based, well, if you've got any kind of core database app with a document-based or just a shoebox type single database app, um, if you, you know, there's always slight tricks, but if you've done a fairly straightforward core data app, it's literally flicking a switch and your app will sync to, to, I, to the user's iCloud. You know, and, that, and, that, and they handle the conflicts between you know, multiple updates and well, you know, they'll send you notifications so you can easily handle it. And you can hook into iCloud if you've got a, any other kind of store, but you're going to be implementing a lot of methods, delegate methods and things to, to make that happen, which is, is just for free. So yeah, I, I, I probably use, I'm probably at the upper end of using Core. I basically use Core Data for anything that has some kind of data store and doesn't have the kind of throughput that means that you know, the performance is probably, probably not appropriate. Uh, I know other people, you know, are sort of at the other end, they use core data when it really makes sense and otherwise they do other stuff. Um, but once you've, you know, th th there's a real benefit, you know, core data is a complex framework, but there's a benefit, just like the, with the rest of Cocoa, when, you've, when you use it regularly and you know it, then, then you can just think, you can have some crazy idea, oh, I'll do an app that does this. And, you know, bang, 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 I've used the GUI, I've got my, um, I've got my, uh, you know, my data model, there's a classes for that. I hook a bit of custom functionality to the object. I wire it into my UI without even thinking. I've just pumped out another app. Whereas if you, if you said, you know, not that other things are more work, but if that's what you're doing for most of your apps, you kind of get a, you know, sort of a muscle memory for doing it, which, which I find quite helpful. Any other questions? Good, because I think we're out of time. So thanks for coming.